Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us again this evening for our School of Arts uh, Visiting Lecture, lecture Series. Uh, my name is Chung Park, and I'm a first year MFA uh, graduate student here at the School of Art. And I'm happy to be welcoming Dr. Juan Car Carlos Castro this evening. Um, before I turn it over to uh, Professor uh, Christopher Schulte from Art Education to give the official intro. Uh, I'd like to read our school and college's uh, land acknowledgement. The indigenous history of the land the University of Arkansas campus sits on goes back to time immemorial. And across that expanse of time, many successive groups have lived here and created sacred legacies, legacies in this area. Fulbright College acknowledges indigenous peoples were forced to leave their ancestral lands, including the Osage, Caddo, and Quapaw nations with ties to Northwest Arkansas. We further recognize that a portion of the Trail of Tears runs through our campus and that the Cherokee, Choctaw, Muskegee Creek, Chickasaw, and Seminole nations passed through what is now Arkansas during this forced removal. We acknowledge all indigenous teachers, researchers, and all other resident residents in our community and region today. We proudly offer indigenous studies in our college and seek continuity and connection to the past as we look to the future with increased collaboration with indigenous governments and entities. Okay, um, and just a reminder uh, at the end of the lecture, we do have a Q&A session. And so please uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom of, uh, of the, the Zoom here to uh, put in any questions you may have uh, during the lecture or after the lecture. Okay, so without further ado, I'll pass this over to Professor Christopher Schulte from Art Education. Thank you. Thank you, Chung. Good evening, everyone. It is an honor to introduce our distinguished guest and speaker this evening. Dr. Juan Carlos Castro is Chair and Associate Professor of Art Education at Concordia University. He is the editor of the book, Mobile Media In and Outside of the Art Classroom, Attending to Identity, Spatiality, Movement, and Materiality, published in 2019, in which he and his team examined how mobile media coupled with creative production, networks knowledge in urban environments to create educational and civic engagement with teens and young adults. His current research as the principal investigator of the Canadian Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council funded project, investigating the creative practices of youth and digital visual learning networks, looks at how young people use digital visual networks to support creative practice outside of formal schooling. Before joining the faculty at Concordia University, Juan Carlos has taught at the University of Illinois, University of British Columbia, Johns Hopkins University, Maryland Institute College of Art, and the Berne College of Art. Juan Carlos is a former national board certified teacher and taught visual art and photography at Towson High School in Maryland. As a high school art teacher, his teaching and curriculum were awarded a Coca-Cola Foundation Distinguished Teacher in the Arts from the National Foundation for Advancement in the Arts and twice awarded with a US Presidential Scholars Teaching Recognition Award. In 2013, he was awarded the Manuel Barkin Memorial Award and in 2022, the National Higher Education Art Educator Award, both from the National Art Education Association. Juan Carlos served as the chair of the National Art Education Association Research Commission from 2018 to 2020. He is also co-editor of the books entitled Educational, Psychological, and Behavioral Considerations in Niche Online Communities 2014 and Youth Practices in Digital Arts and New Media, Learning in Informal and Informal Settings, 2015. Juan Carlos, on behalf of the School of Art and the University of Arkansas, welcome. Thank you, Chris. And also thank you, Chung, uh, for setting all of this up. Uh, and thank you for the generous introduction uh, today. So this talk is entitled Digital Visual Learning Networks. Um, and this is a title and, and a name that I've came up with um, over, over my career research to, at this point, to understand how um, young people come to learn from each other, uh, primarily through visual means. And we'll, I'll break that down to you for you in this talk tonight. Um, so tonight I'm going to present what have become the most persis persistent themes in my research to date. 
And that is how the digital has impacted visual learning and the networks that are enacted as a result. While the focus of my research has been on the digital, be it mobile phones or social media, the implications for learning through the visual, I believe, can go beyond digital devices and instead encompass materiality, spatiality, sociality, and its effects on learning. Before I begin, and given that my work is grounded in spatial relationality, I would like to acknowledge that I am physically located on unceded indigenous lands. The Kanagahe Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which I am today. Uh, Totonge, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations, and today it is home to a diverse population of Indigenous and other peoples. I would also like to acknowledge that even though I'm an individual here presenting on what has been a career of research, that I am in relation to and supported by so many wonderful, bright, and generous established and emerging scholars. Also, through generous research funded, funding provided by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, I've been able to assemble teams to work through questions of teaching and learning through digital media. And I'll be describing these distinct, uh, distinct research projects a little later on. So first, some context. Um, I believe it's important in anything really to understand why you do what you do. It's also more, it's also important to situate oneself and one's identity within a context to better understand one's motivation, be it as an art teacher or an emerging artist. Growing up, I didn't have much interest in school. I was a Latino living in Baltimore, which at the time, anyone with my ethnicity was a rarity. It was hard to fit in. And I was excluded because I was neither a part of the majority white or minority black communities. Yet, it was not until a friend in my neighborhood invited me to help him build puppets and paint sets at a local community art center that I experienced the social power of art to connect me to others in positive ways. The artists I worked with demonstrated a way of living and experiencing the world that finally made sense to me. I felt I belonged. I've always enjoyed drawing and afterwards started taking art and photography courses in high school. There I was lucky enough to have two inspiring, thoughtful and committed art teachers who pushed me to think in new ways and make art I really cared about. I went from someone who contemplated dropping out of school to completing an art degree. Throughout my BFA, I reflected on how my experience with art in my community and the school environment changed my life which is why I chose to become an art educator. During my time teaching art and photography in high school, I'd always been interested in how my students learned and strived to create a community where they felt they belonged. I was curious about their creative practices in and outside of school. I wanted to know how my teaching could connect them, not only to each other, but to the broader world outside of them, outside of the school walls. My curiosity spurred me to pursue a PhD to explore questions of teaching and learning in the visual arts. Through research, I've come to better understand my former students, myself as a teacher and, and an artist and the broader implications of young people's cultural practices. My experience as a former high school and community-based art educator is brought to bear on the research that I'll share tonight. And so why digital media? How did I get into that? And my, uh, you know, I, you know, my, my wife would sometimes say, oh, you're the tech guy, but you know, sometimes tech is frustrating and I haven't necessarily always been drawn to digital technology. But when I left the, the high school art classroom, my former students back in 2006 had started a group online on this thing called Facebook. Um, the people who had attended my art classes at the school. I was surprised at how many of my former students, many of whom who knew each other and many of whom who did not, so readily self-organized into a community of artists mentoring each other and sharing their work. The group has since ex had expanded 
to include current high school students as well as university students from around the world. As a high school art teacher, I attempted to enact a poly, an, a, a, that kind of pedagogy that followed my students' interests. And that meant co-constructing a place for students and me to participate in, with, and through, a place to explore ideas. So initially, I had no interest in studying technology or, or the impacts of technology, but following my students and paying attention to what young people were doing, it became pretty apparent to me that social media, and now mobile media, uh, is a big part of how young people connect. And so it's in that spirit of following my students that guides my research. So let's, let's start with the digital visual learning networks. Let's start with the digital. So when I define the digital, and I'll, and I'll break it down in a moment, um, it can mean the devices we use such as smartphones, tablets, desktops, um, to the digital platforms such as social media, software like PowerPoint, Excel spreadsheets, Photoshop, Illustrator, and the algorithms that organize and deliver information and search queries. Digital technology has become embedded in our lives from the watches, sleep trackers, 24 seven glucose monitors, pacemakers, sensors in our cars, even bicycles, um, just about, any material that you can think of that is whether needed or not is dependent on digital code to operationalize. It's become near ubiquitous in North America. So much of our time with objects that rely on digital code comes down to, you guessed it, our mobile phones. You can't see my mobile phone there. Uh, our phones. And if you've been able to avoid using one, bravo, I'd love to chat and much admiration to you. And, you know, it gets me thinking, like it's interesting where that sentiment of that statement comes from. Is it one of nostalgia? Like, wow, you can function without a phone. I wish I could do that. Uh, one for longing for a time when you could just breathe and walk and observe and not feel like you have to constantly check your device uh, or, or check your phone. I think it's an important consideration to think about how our day-to-day -day being is tied to this device and our feelings about it. Um, one, one thing that I like to do is check my screen time periodically. And you can do this under settings. If you have an iPhone, you just go to your settings app and look under screen time. And you can set it up so it gives you weekly reports. It can tell you, you know, how much time did you spend on this app? How much time did you spend on that app? Um, and I don't think it should be a cringe moment. You know, I don't think, I don't think, uh, you know, I think there's this sort of um, tacit assumption that the more time you spend on your phone, that somehow that's a bad thing. I think it's just different. I think it's just the quality of living in this, in this moment uh, that, that the phone, this object has become a really important part of our lives. I think to be self-conscious about it is important. And whether or not you choose to do more time or less time, that's something that's, um, that should be your personal decision. Oh, and if you have an Android, uh, you can also open your settings app, select the digital well-being and parental controls, hit the dashboard, and then you can check your screen time under screen time. Um, so when I look at mine, uh, I'm not as bad as Karina's iPhone here from the uh, Apple web page. I end up spending way more time on Instagram than anything else, but I was also surprised to find some other things uh, in there about myself, uh, like the app that's most constantly in use is my uh, Bose sleep earbuds. So I'm a, I'm a recovering um, sleep deprived parent, so the kids can sleep now, they're old enough, but for those of you who've had young kids, your sleep will always be disrupted because you're always listening. So I've, I, I experiment with different things to help me sleep better. And it turns out, oh my gosh, I'm always using that app to help me sleep. Um, and it, it, it has helped. So I think you learn these things from, you know, about your interfaces with technology and, and it's, a, it's, it's a healthy thing to do. So we need to acknowledge that we are 
becoming more and more entangled in digital media. So what do, what do you spend your time doing uh, on your phones? What do I spend my time on doing your phones and why is that important? Well, it's important because it's as, on one hand, it's, it's as deeply personal as who we are, but it's also deeply cultural. And uh, Jason Farman writes about the multitude of uses for a phone in different geographical and cultural contexts. And he writes, um, for example, in India, five, 10, 20, 15 years ago, smartphone, I mean, five or 10 years ago, smartphones were a shared resource used by a network of people. So, you know, you, you, there's not, everyone gets a phone. It's, it's something that's more communal. In Africa, farmers use their phones for managing financial transactions before your bank even developed a mobile app. He uses these examples to point out that our time with digital doesn't always have to be used in a prescribed manner by the manufacturer or by what we see in the cultural practices around us in the everyday. In fact, he argues that cre creative misuse is a better way better way to understand our relationship with technology from a passive to more actively engaged relationship. And this is something that's I've been very interested in as an educator um, to think about the mobile device uh, and what ways we can creatively misuse it to, to understand our relationship with it better. So what are young people doing with their phones and every um, you know every once in a while I get an alert from the Pew Research Center, uh, which does just great demographic survey research um, of different cultural practices, beliefs, opinions on a variety of topics. Um, but they also do a lot with young people and their technology use. So right now, and this is this is an increase. Um, in 2019, they found that 95% of all American teens have access to a smartphone, and 45% say they're always on the internet. And that is up from just three, four years beforehand when they did the, the, another survey, similar survey, uh, up from 88% having access to a smartphone. So it, it is becoming a ubiquitous technology, especially for young people. Um, so what are they doing? I mean, we can see in the, in the chart published by the Pew Research Center, a lot of times it's just to, it's just to take up those moments. It's to take up those in-between moments. Um, it's, it's a way to connect. And Dana Boyd's research, um, a digital ethnographer who works with young people, uh, finds that it's a it's a much more nuanced way of connecting that is both using the, the using social media and the mobile device to maintain relationships, but also um, use it as a way to coordinate in person meetings. Um, what I love is love seeing is, is learning new things, you know. How many times does a young person say, oh, I'll just Google that, or I have a question, I need to Google that. Um, and then this one is also interesting, the, the idea of avoiding interacting with people um, as, as, as a key feature for um, why you use your phone. So maybe you don't want that in-person social interaction. Um, other researchers have found that besides texting, sending those short messages, the taking and sharing of photographs through phones are essential social activity uh, for teens. Here in Canada and in the United States, more than half of sm smartphone users take digital photographs and videos to share in social networks like Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat. The smartphone has become a ubiquitous device in the social lives of young people through communication, image production, and dissemination. And since the early 2000s, digital tools and content have merged, creating a culture of media convergence, uh, a term that Henry Jenkins coined in 2006. The convergence of digital photography and mobile phones has spurred a technology of the everyday life. Now photographs of everyday events and objects are judged worthy of sharing for those, um, for those who are 
I've used the film camera. Can you ever remember taking a picture of that dish? You know, I'm going to load the film in my camera and I'm going to, and then I'm going to, I can't wait to get this developed so I can show everybody my, uh, my slideshow of what I ate. Um, I, I don't, I certainly don't remember doing that pre-digital. Um, other researchers like Dana Boyd, who I just mentioned, argued that teens are often able to negotiate complex social relationships online to build healthy ones offline, in contrast to uh, Turkle and Twenge's uh, assertion that the avoidance of social interaction with people can lead to isolation and mental health issues. So it's a double-edged sword um, that I think we have to approach with nuance and when it comes to young people using these devices. So in, the in my working kind of understanding of digital and digital media, um, and this is, this is not a kind of fixed four categories. This really is something that for me is a kind of assemblage in a kind of Latorian sense, an assemblage of concepts, which help me understand what the digital does in, so in social relationships and in teaching and learning. And it come, for me, at this moment, in the data that I've worked with and, and the young people I've talked to, it comes down to issue characteristics of mobility, of spatiality, ubiquity, and materiality. Mobile, mo, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break that down for you right, right now, what I mean by that. So, so mobility. Mobile media further expands and amplifies the ubiquity of social media through computing experience that can happen anytime and anywhere. Teens and young adults in industrialized nations, especially North America, are primarily using their smartphones and computing devices to access the internet. We've seen that in the data that I just presented. Mobility studies, which attends to the flows of material and M learning, are important to understand the role of this mobile device. So when I, when I talk about mobility, I'm not just talking about mobile phones and using mobile phones. I'm talking about um, uh, movement and the learning that is entangled with that device and the relationships that are built through and with the device and the object. So often mobility is assessed in terms of relationships as defined by Cresswell and uh, Peter Adde um, and Yuri, as the relative movement between a set of actors and conditions. And these relationships uh, have been referred to as moorings or unmoorings or immobilities and mobilities. What defines the qualities of, of these movement relationships can be, in, can be understood as either physical or even political. Um, and in some of my research, we've used Peter Adde's theorization of immobilities to understand better how young people's movement or lack thereof impacted their educational engagement. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, so mobility is, is really less about the mobile device itself and more about what kinds of movement relationships between power, between, um, between subjectivities, uh, between ways of knowing um, and those social relationships. What does it enable, disable? What does it amplify? Um, and what kind of shifts are prompted by this digital device? Second, thinking about how the spatiality, how spatiality changes. And so the discussion of the role of space and time in education is anchored, we, you know, is anchored in the theory of spatiality that views space as multiple, co-constructive and dynamic. In this view, spatiality is an emergent property of interactions among human and non-human actors, something I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, in space time. My, um, my colleague Esan Akbari writes, 
Spatiality is the notion that our ontological and epistemological assumptions about space are fundamental to our ability to understand culture, society, politics, learning, and indeed most aspects of our everyday lives. The spatial turn refers to the intellectual movement since the 1990s, which has placed an emphasis on space, place, and mapping in various disciplines in the humanities, including geography, history, cultural studies, and education. The various approaches to spatiality share in common the fundamental assumption that space is not a static container, but rather, quote, a dynamic multiplicity that is constantly being produced by simultaneous practices so far, as cited in uh, Tara Fenwork, Edwards, and Saul Chuck. In this conceptualization, space is the product of a multiplicity of human and non-human interactions, and time and space are inseparable from each other. The concepts of relational space and space-time are fundamental to this theorization of spatiality, and coupled with mobility, start to help us to understand how space and time with movement uh, help us to understand the role of negotiating this new digital reality. Third, ubiquity. Mobile phones have made our screen time ubiquitous. My other colleague, Martin Lalande writes, with the ubiquity of digital technologies and the regular arrival of new features, new operating systems, and new architectures and social networking, the complexity of social interaction continues to become an increasingly significant of young people's lives. My other colleague, G.H. Greer, writes, space and flexibility around student engagement are structured um, in digital practices by asynchronicity and ubiquity. And what this means for teaching and learning are possibilities for student engagement that are literally outside of linear time constraints and available everywhere. In the context of mobile learning, time and space are made explicit as material factors in the formation of learning networks. Students can interact when they are ready at any time and from any location. The time between classroom instruction and online student responses as a productive increase in what teachers often refer to as wait time, that silent moment that allows students to think after a question is asked. Opportunities for student engagement are increased in this way by enabling a unique combination of student readiness with the omnipresent accessibility of devices like mobile phones that register learning. So here's our, we, we observed in one of our, uh, one of our research studies here, um, the the two images on the right of the digital clock. Um, and what we found was um, when, when young people and in, in, in this in our participants in this closed private social network um, couldn't sleep, they would start to post to each other images of the clock and the time in the middle of the night as a way to kind of signal, I'm up and is anybody else up? and, and uh, comments would, uh, would follow under these images should anyone else be awake at that time. So it's, um, it, really, it really opens up um, that space-time relationship to teaching and learning outside of that prescribed moment of class, of that class moment in that classroom. And, and fourth, materiality, especially the digital materiality. So what is generated? What is the materiality of, din of the digital and what are its effects on us? So materiality in this sense of the digital are the effects of the non-human actants in a network or an assemblage of human activity. With digital, as mentioned before, it's the object, the design, the price, the time, the resources, the demands to function, the code, which we understand that's something that is not as neutral, um, especially when we look at the work of um, Kathy O'Neill's Weapons of Mass Destruction or uh, Virginia Eubank's work on the social inequality that algorithms have had on low-income uh, populations. Um, we also see it in, in Eli Pariser's work where he wrote, 
on how digital algorithms create, and you probably heard the term filter bubbles that inhibit internet users' ability to see outside of their preferences. I was just lamenting about this the other day, like um, on Twitter, I find Twitter to really create robust filter bubbles. Like I'm a, I'm a big fan of cycling you know, and cycling, racing around the world. And, and I follow a lot of cyclists, but I also follow a lot in the world of education and educational research and also, um, but I find that if I'm liking one topic more than another, I don't see the other topic. And lately I've been liking a lot of uh, work, uh, work of researchers. And I've noticed all my, all my tweets about cycling, the cycling world have disappeared. So that bubble has really reinforced around that topic. So the code, the digital alg algorithms, not only inhibit and reinforce what we see online, they can also have per profound effects on offline sociality. So I mentioned um, Kathy O'Neill and Virginia Eubanks works. Um, they've argued that uh, these algorithms make recommendations like whether you get a mortgage, government food assistance, or even retain your job as a teacher, and that exacerbates social inequality. So, for example, in the book Weapons of Math Destruction, Kathy O'Neill gives the example of a teacher in Washington, D.C. who was fired for poor performance as determined by an evaluation algorithm, the teacher value added model. Sarah Wasoski was an excellent teacher as determined by colleagues, parents, and her school administration. And what happened in her case, it was suspected that the teachers who taught Wasoski's students the year prior changed students' test scores to perform better. So Wasaki, Wasaki inherited a group of students who according to their test results were above average, but in reality were below grade level in reading and writing. When Wysoski's students scored lower, the teacher value added model penalized her. There was no recourse for her and she was fired by the end of the school year. Because Wysoski had ex excellent recommendations, she easily found a job in a wealthy DC suburb. Wysoski's former school that served students from a low socioeconomic neighborhood lost a good teacher and inequality is reinforced. So mobility, spatiality, ubiquity, and materiality. It's not just about this phone, this object, this social media platform, that there are other, other things at play and at work and, and that I am mobilizing in a sense uh, in this assemblage to understand the role that digital has in teaching and learning. So what do I mean by visual learning. When I, I would have to say over 15 years of working with young people that one of the, one of the most pronounced findings, if you will, has been the impact of, of looking of, of seeing and learning from that, that act of seeing and that act of looking and the learning that results. And it comes from, uh, again, 15 years of research, three major projects, the first being my dissertation research on social networking, uh, using a methodology where I introduced a, a curriculum into an art classroom where young people could um, create new identities and and make work in response to a curric an open-ended curriculum that used constraints to get them to reevaluate their habitual ways of seeing the world around them and then posting and responding to each other in this social network. And that was um, the project on left and inquiry into knowing, learning and teaching art through new and social media. Um, at the end of that work, end of that research project in, um, in, 20, in 2009, 2010, um, I wrote at the end of, of my dissertation that this thing called an iPhone was gonna really play a big role um, in 
how we come to interact with each other. And so since 2012, uh, up until 2019 with the, with the, with the publication of our book, um, we've been working on this project called Mont Coin. And Mont Coin is French for my corner, my area. So, um, and it was uh, investigating how mobile learning networks to foster educational engagement with at-risk youth. And we worked with um, a group of young people uh, at a school specifically designed for students who have or were at risk of dropping out in the Montreal area. Um, that, that population expanded as we got more funding um, to work with students from other areas, other schools, other demographics, um, and using the mobile phone and social media to have students, you know, again, a designed curriculum to look at the world around them. So we would post missions on their mobile phone uh, that, would, that would be images and prompts, as you see here, like self, what's my collection, what I see, where I learn best, what can I change, my neighborhood, you know, culminating at the end of the project to post your own mission to create a much more decentralized interaction with each other. Um, and then uh, my current project that I'm working on, uh, it looks at uh, digital creators. So young people who are autodidactics, you know, they are learning and teaching how to make art on their own um, outside of formal uh, teaching and learning institutions uh, in the arts, or they may be in formal institutions um, art schools, university programs, but they are also maintaining a creative practice outside of any, any uh, fixed curriculum or program of study. And so we've been following them using digital ethnography, case studies, and visual, analogy, visual analysis. And we're finding some fascinating um, insights into how they build community. And I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in, in a little bit, um, some of the initial things that we've been finding so far. So the project has a few more years to go. Um, we're in the midst of it, but it's, uh, it's already yielding some interesting things. So let's, I want to present my working definition of learning and I call it working because I realize that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, pretty, um, doesn't make sense to have a definition of learning that is, def that is fixed because we're always learning. And I find that the more that I work with young people and listen to them, the more they teach me about what learning is all about. So um, for me, my working definition in, in, in this work that I do uh, with young people is thinking of learning as a continual process of adaptation, one that's in reciprocity between actors and material. So the standard definition of learning that we often think of, it's as a process of acquiring knowledge. Okay, I gotta get that information I've learned. I've got that thing I've learned. Or if you're a teacher, oh, I need them to look at this artwork. I need them to know how to do this kind of painting. I need them to know this process. And that is, they've learned it when they've done it. Um, so most teaching in schools today is based on this assumption of knowledge as a kind of object that can be packaged and delivered. This definition of knowledge is conflated with the meaning of information. Information is a fact, while knowledge is grounded in, in interpretation of something and the subsequent action that comes from it in response. When knowing something, a knower will reference their experience. It is these previous experiences that guide a learner's movement through the world. And knowledge also resides in the body, it is both a mental process and physically structured. Learning is the ability to adapt to new experiences and contexts. It's a process of change in the formation and structuring of knowledge. What this means for educators is that teaching is not solely the act of delivering information, but also about creating conditions for experiences that 
learners both can understand based on prior knowledge, but also moves them to adapt to new experiences. Further, it's also a learning is a reciprocal act. So as one learns, one moves differently in a space. And that movement in a space that has changed changes other relationships. And it becomes this cascading effect through those network of relationships. So one could always say that learning is this thing that happens in, 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 in a kind of hermetically sealed individual. But in reality, when someone learns in a group or in a, in a collective, it does impact everybody else um, in different degrees of other kinds of learning. So um, I think it's an important point to, to make that learning is not always an individual act, but one that happens in relation to others. So how do we know this? Well, what we do is a lot of the work that we do in our research is extensive interviews. So initial interviews, follow-up interviews, um, uh, an analysis, and also looking at the, the visual work that um, people produce and share with us, and tagging and tracking of participants' image stylistic tendencies and the collective trends that are generated from that. Um, I was sharing with Chris in the preparation of this talk um, that it, it was a really great opportunity to go back and look at you know, just a, a trove of interview data and thousands and thousands of images that we've coded and tagged and just, you know, see, were there things that I missed? Were there things that I haven't seen yet? And what, what, what are those things that are still being reinforced? And what I've come to find in 15 years of, of doing this work is that the, the the most powerful way of learning for young people is learning through looking. So the difference between the physical classroom and what does this mean in terms of the implications of like the digital and why does that matter to the digital? Well, it matters because um, it's, it matters because having access to the work of one's peers both in and outside of the classroom using like social media is a great benefit to many of art and design students as it enables them to view and comment on the work at their convenience. So thinking about that idea of ubiquity without the perceived social hierarchy that often inhibits students from participating fully in classroom discussions. I think this is one of the things that we have to realize as that, um, you know, like the critique space in, in schools of fine art. The critique space is a very important learning space, but it's also a very per performative space of power and social hierarchy. You know, you have the teacher, you have certain players in the classroom uh, performing certain acts of power in that relationship and social hierarchies do develop. Um, it's, it's actually something that we've looked at here at Concordia. Um, in response to um, violence in the classroom, uh, in the critique space. So working with studio uh, faculty, we've started to um, really seriously look at the critique and uh, what are the promises and perils of critiquing and the traditional studio critique and what does that, what does that do? What, does that, what kind of tensions do they create? What kind of opportunities do they create? And so I think we need to keep that in mind that it is not the only way to engage with one's work and that, um, that there are students, there are people out there listening to this webinar who just sometimes don't feel comfortable talking about in a, in a class about someone else's work, they, but they might have something super valuable to share, something profound. And so um, I found this play out in, 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 in studio fine arts classrooms and also high school art classrooms that 
It's um, having the ability to really take the time and look closely at someone's work that, and what digital media enables for someone to, you know, okay, I'm gonna sit down and, and really look at someone's work and spend some time with it. Um, that that level and, and interval of engagement um, sometimes can't happen in a classroom and we have to recognize that as valuable. So um, the, that act of looking needs to be pervasive and in so many ways, especially in, the, in visual arts education. So, and social media is one way to do it. It's not the, it's not the only way to do it. And, you know, I've, I've gotten into uh, discussions with folks who will say, you just want to put everything online and not, and not interact in person. And, um, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying a multitude opens up, a new opportunity opens up so that we're able to uh, provide uh, maybe sometimes a more equitable complement to or a different complement to the studio uh, in-person synchronous studio exp critique experience. So, um, you know, so again, like students who may feel anxious about talking with their peers are able, now able to view the work online for extended periods. And if it's possible, you know, they could take the time to write a comment. They can think about each other's work and they can, and they can interact in that way. So um, when we use these technologies as modalities for interaction and learning from each other, they, they really do open up that opportunity to enable students to really spend the time looking, looking very deeply and, and very meaningfully for them. Um, and their peers work. So here's, here's a quote from my dissertation research because it's, it's a good one. Um, when, when we talk about the comments, you know, like if you can post a comment on someone's work on someone. Um, so they say sometimes with your art class, you don't get to see other people's work. Sometimes it's up on the walls, but you don't really like, like here, like in a social network, social media place, it's a place where you can share it and everyone can leave comments and stuff. If it's hanging on the wall, you can't quite leave comments, especially if you don't know the person. And, you know, we have to keep that in mind that, you know, some, some people just don't interact in the same kind of ways to be able to go up and talk as, say, a teacher would be able to and is expected and paid to do. So um, seeing peers art online really decentralizes the curricular structure and accommodates the kind of peer-to-peer -peer interaction that we find on social media. And the structure attempts to flatten the power relationship of teacher-student knowledge production, facilitating a move from top-down hierarchy to focus on individuals and collectives, working together to pursue common and discrete artistic goals and ideas. So, Here's another quote from uh, the Monquan research. Each of us, I think, taught. We watched what others were doing and we learned alone. People could transform the aspect of what they wanted to show in their photos. We could show things in our own way when we learn from each other's photos. So, and that's in response to that question. We always ask in, at the end of any of these iterations or projects or working with schools, how did you learn? And they, you know, some would say they learn from comparing images, those they liked and those they did not, as way to see, ways to see the differences. Some participants said they learn not from one particular image, but from the act of looking at the entire collection of images over and over again. Others remarked that the comments they received about their images were important for their learning, while others described learning from reading the comments on other people's images. So, um, you know, thinking about when, you know, this is, this is for the studio faculty and, and the audience here, when you're in your studio classroom and you're giving feedback, other people are, your students are listening to that, you know, and they're paying attention to that. And that is teaching them, even if it's for somebody else. So, you know, I think that's important to understand kind of that entanglement 
that we're all in, in the learning environment. And here's a humbling one. <laughs> You know, and, and and again, I'm pulling a, I'm pulling an example from my dissertation research because this one's pretty good, but it has come up quite a bit. In the curriculums that we would work with, uh, the curricula that we would work with, um, young people from different schools over the past decade, uh, we'd always have a portion where we would show some exemplars of work that um, of different artists to inspire and to give them some different things to think about. Because you know, frankly, that's what we do as art teachers, as um, we like to show the work of artists that we're into, because I think, you know, that inspires. And it's interesting, every time we'll, we'll get to that question in the interview and we ask, okay, so how much did you, were you inspired by the artists that we would show? And then, you know, usually they would be either diplomatic or just go, um, but when we talk about, well, who inspired you? to make certain works in the group, they had no problem in mentioning specific images like, oh yes, that image really inspired me to make this image. So here on the image uh, of the tomato, sliced cherry tomatoes, that's kind of out of focus and, um, you know, was made by a student who was just learning photography. They were, the, the student on the right who had been taking visual arts and knew photography really well talked about being inspired by the image on the left. You know, like, okay, someone with tremendous amount of skill, tremendous amount of know-how being inspired by a peer who didn't necessarily have the same skill sets. So, you know, and when we look at those view counts and likes that the images of students that are being, were, are attributed as influential, I'm always, always surprised that what they pick is vastly different from what I would say is quality, you know? And I, and I had to check my own preconceptions of what is good art. Because at first I would say, oh, you know, this is the function of what they don't know uh, good, good art is, you know? I have a BFA. I've been a practicing artist for blah, 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 blah. And you know, and that, that got me thinking, well, no, maybe they know something that I don't maybe I've been encultured into a way of thinking and knowing that comes out of a certain power relation structure. Maybe they have, maybe they have not, they have yet to be enculturated in order to value what I value. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges for me going from being an art teacher to a researcher was to take a step back and say, okay, there's some excitement going on about why these students are inspired by this image. So I have to value that uh, first and foremost. And, and I can't squash that because that kind of excitement is important and more than, what you th more than what I think is good or bad art. And it's always happening. We're always seeing that, um, that those peer relationships that, that, they're, that, that learners have together are so powerful in that kind of inspiration that happens. So again, looking at our data set of images produced by our student participants, we found evidence of similar compositional strategies being deployed by different individuals. In these three images, we can observe those similar strategies in the composition of the image and the angling of the camera to create a dynamic and dramatic images. So when then we follow up and interview them, they identified the important role these images did play in their learning. And, you know, and they keep saying it's through the photos of others that I've learned through this project. And what's also, uh, what's also fascinating is sometimes they won't even, they'll, you know, we've, we've done interviews with, with students who will go, okay, yeah, I, um, you know, so-and-so's image really inspiring. I actually went out and tried to make an image just like that. I saw that the, in their comments, they described they use this filter and I wanted to try it. And then we go, but you never posted anything uh, that looked like that. Oh no, I just made it for myself. It's on my phone, but I didn't want to share it. I just wanted to figure it out. So, you know, sometimes they might not even share the image, but they might be deeply impacted and actively engaged in learning how someone else made that image. And, you know, it doesn't have to be asynchronous either, that, that there is value in that in person interaction. And so I know throughout this 
talk I've been building up to that. But it's really important also to have those moments of synchronous in-person activity, you know, where we, we do, we would take, um, we would take young people out and we would do field trips and it was initiated by them. Um, to, and they would say, you know, we really liked seeing the different angles of view when you looked at the pictures of everyone. Um, so they, they love to see how people would approach something at the same time together and how they physically were, you know, taking a picture of that. Oh, wow. So they got down really low and laid on their belly and looked up um, to get that angle or um, they did this or that. So, and I think that's, this is important to understand that at the core of what I'm interested in here and doing with digital and curricula is not to go to a fully remote or fully virtual learning environment. And I think we've really been kind of, I know at our institution fixated on this, you know, okay, we did remote for the pandemic, but it's destroying everything. We need to be in person. You know, we're hearing that rhetoric constantly now uh, in the public schools, but also even at the university level. But I, I'm more interested in that understanding of the differences between things to understand new ways of seeing a relationship. You know, so like I think of the example um, of the relationship of the artist's relationship to painting with the popularization of photography and how that played a role in our understanding of what painting as a medium does. No longer is the painter charged with capturing a pictorial descriptive reality of say a person or a landscape. Photography could render that far better. But now questions emerge about what paint does. Uh, similarly, the pandemic, the same questions are raised. We have tools, we've habituated the ability to do these, these lectures, these Zoom lectures or remote learning or using online uh, platforms for sharing work. I think um, those are excellent tools that we should keep using and we should still be in person too, you know, and we should blend these things together because they do have value. Um, earlier mentioned uh, the work that we were interested in started with this assumption. This is a whole other research tangent, but I just wanted to touch on it briefly about civic engagement. And we went into um, we went into the mobile research with this idea that um, if we could get young people engaged in their civic environment, they'd be more engaged with their educational environment. And what we found is they didn't really care. They really wanted to know how to make a good picture. And it wasn't until, until we started to teach them some basics of photography, of composition, of lighting, that we could reintroduce that question of what they would change in their environment so that they felt like they have something meaningful to say. And so I think that's important. And also an important aspect is, you know, and that I'm always emphasizing is that, you know, message, medium, material, there's, should, there's no, there shouldn't be a, you know, a hierarchy that they, they are all entangled together in this kind of horizontal uh, relationship. And that uh, young people, you know, they were, they were trying to tell us that, like, look, you want us to say something important. We don't feel like we can. We don't have the visual grammar to do so. We also found that um, empathy builds when the life worlds of young people are shared in these kinds of closed, intimate, networked relationships. One participant said, I saw how the other participants live through what they posted. In a certain sense, I had access to the private worlds of everyone in the group as they take photos of their pets, their homes, and their neighbors. The act of making images with their mobile devices is a process of discovery, definition, and the appropriations of spaces in reference to themselves. And by creating these multimodal publications that mingled picture, text, commentary, and geographic location and temporal and emotional state, participants developed identity tableaus to communicate ideas of self with each other. They also learned aesthetic, you know, aesthetics and seeing their spaces anew. The act of viewing uh, sometimes reveal new interpretations of personal space in terms of other participants who live nearby and the desire to see things that were posted to actually go and visit them. Uh, so the learning here was also was seeing that space new. 
uh, and the act of viewing sometimes revealed new interpretations and prompted um, students to investigate them. We also know that collective learners happen. And because we're working with a database in which we can track and code, we can see the impact of trends, you know, and this happens in physical classrooms too. It's not exclusive to digital media, but now we can track that. And so here's an example of once a few images somewhat related start to, to be post and liked quite a bit, we start to see more in, in successive days being posted. And this is nothing new to young people. You know, even when we, we ask them, when you post an image, you can inspire others to follow you. There's a person who starts to take a picture of a cat and many others will start taking pictures of cats. There's a person who takes a picture of a dog and posts it, others will continue to take pictures of dogs. This happens in our classrooms. This happens in the studio. We are influenced subtly by what's happening around us. And what we're seeing right now in our current research is that, um, that there is sophistication in the kind of communities that are being chosen to participate from Twitter to Discord to Instagram, they all have different purposes. And so this brings me to the network, so the socio-materiality of learning, and that we are entangled with non-human actants and actors. So these consist of images and the algorithms, which I mentioned, that control the delivery and dissemination of images. So it's, what this means is learning is contingent on a network of relationship with peers, teachers, curriculum materials, technology, and more. The socio-material frameworks and companies that, that accompany this means that the day-to-day -day online activity uh, and the mediated exchanges between people online is, is something that is um, should needs to be thought of as, as I, and I've used this term before, as flat or horizontal, this non-hierarchical um, structure that our actions shape the non-human actor actants, and that affects our work as actors uh, in a network of relationality. And so what this means is that we really do need to consider the materiality of of what we do as artists and also as educators, that the materiality exists in um, the stylistic tendencies that are adopted to the kinds of power relationships that are established and reinforced, that these things all have matter. They all, um, well, materials matter. So we are entangled with one another. So when I, when I return to this understanding of learning I presented earlier as something that is a reciprocal relationship, a human-centric position uh, would hold a singular learner or teacher as somehow held above in causal importance in terms of learning without necessarily considering those material conditions um, of the learner. Um, materiality matters in learning environments in and outside of the studio from what is brought by those who assemble together to the accessibility of a space for say a disabled student, to the language used both spoken and written in space to create the material conditions for learning. Um, so what does this all mean? Keeping in mind your role as a place, as an artist, educator, and creative pack practitioner. And I like to use network metaphors to help us understand um, those relationships. So, um, on the left, centralized networks, one that has many nodes linking to one central hub. And this type of network architecture is very efficient. Teacher in the center, broadcast the message, everybody follows along. Distributed on the right, very similar to how the initial uh, internet, the Arapa net, uh, designed by the and commissioned for the US Army communication network as a precursor to the internet. Um, very resistant to, to uh, collapse because you knock out a node, it can still, we can still communicate, but it's not as efficient. And then you have decentralized networks, which are kind of that in-between Goldilocks space. But decentralized networks also have certain dynamics to them. Um, 
So let's think of, you know, a traditional artwork or teacher or learning environment in this way, where we see the teacher as the hub for all information, knowledge, skill, and authority. But what we know is that there's social learning that's happening. But what if we start to think of that network of relationships as more decentralized, as not say, you know, the teacher's going to be there and the teacher plays a huge power role in the classroom. But what if we were aware and acknowledged and embraced social learning by physical proximity in in-person moments with thinking about social learning across media, time and space to then encompass social learning across media, time and space through and with objects as something that no longer resides solely in the teacher or even the students, but also in the images, interfaces and ideas. So thinking of teaching and learning in this way and designing our relationships in this way creates a much more robust and I believe equitable um, mode of learning. So I like to offer just, I'm gonna conclude with four considerations. I know I'm going over time here, so I apologize. Um, four considerations for your role as an artist or an educator in light of what I presented this evening. So first, this idea of mobility, materiality, and spatiality. Thinking of learning not confined to one privileged space and time. While the pandemic lockdowns and remote education have come to be seen as oppressive, difficult, and less desirable by institutions and the able-bodied, it has provided new modalities for teaching, learning, and working. By critically considering movement and the material moorings that enable or disable movement, we can better understand what works and doesn't work for our students, each other, and ourselves. Movement, or lack thereof, is not independent of the material and spatial conditions enacted, entrenched, and maintained. While I didn't get too much into the inequalities of these dynamics this evening, it would behoove me not to mention it here, that many of the material and spatial conditions that create immobilities are entrenched in our everyday experiences. And these need to be accounted for. Second, that openness to emergence, openness for new relationships and entanglements with material space and time provide fertile groundwork for creative work, fertile ground for creative work. I've written at length from a teacher's perspective about the open-ended curriculum or designing constraints that enable to create the conditions for, the dif for difference to emerge. And these are prompts that were both easy, yet, uh, easy to understand yet difficult to answer. And I'm talk talking about how we engage with what is habitual, where we're not only looking closer at how we engage and what we notice in the world, but the interpretive framing with which we engage the world. Context sensitive constraints are something that as Bill Dahl writes, enough of a bird to stimulate the openness, stimulate the students to rethinking their habitual methods, but not so much of a burr, the reorganization would fall apart or not be attempted. By orienting what we do as artists and educators with this kind of openness to constraints, not as things that hold us back, but those things we bump up against, which show us new ways of being, doing, and knowing. So I like to use this image of a Petri dish to illustrate that the things we make being an artwork and art assignment are not a set of instructions or a prescribed outcome, but rather fertile, a fertile medium for something to emerge. Third, part of that openness is the value of peer learning. In the context of art school for art critic Jerry Saltz, and I'd have to somewhat agree with, with his modest proposals, but it's really point three that, that I think it, illustrates the value of peer learning in art school is that the relationships you're making and forging now will support you well beyond any single course or your degree. And finally, it seems pretty obvious to say this, but look at the work of others as one of your best teachers. Of course, you will look to the work of established contemporary artists, those artworks hung on the walls of crystal bridges and in your art history textbooks, but also embrace the work of your peers as, as something that has having an important impact on your own work and learning. Take the time in your peer network to look at each other's art beyond crit time. Ask to see what your peers' passion projects are, and they probably have those, those that are out happening outside of classes. 
ask your peers what artists they are looking at, be it found on social media or at the local art gallery. The more deliberate and intentional you are in creating your learning network of peers, teachers, artists, objects, materials, and experiences, the more robust, more rich your learning will be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Dr. Um, Carlos Castro for your uh, very interesting lecture this evening. Um, yes, uh, so we have uh, time for a couple questions. Um, please uh, let us know if you have any, you can drop it in the Q&A function. And uh, looks like we have here right now from uh, Ted Hemming, Hemig. How would you say your research applies to students who create work that cannot be effectively communicated through a digital format, i.e. installation, sculpture, and large-scale paintings or drawings? That's a great question, uh, Ted. Thank you. Um, I want to go, I want to pull it up so I can read it carefully. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, yeah, absolutely. Because with installation and sculpture, um, and large scale paintings and drawings, for sure, that's probably a huge challenge because, you know, when you think in a kind of Marilou Ponty sense, the, the, the only way we understand space and time as sculpture is, is a body in motion. You know, so the body has to move in relationship to, to the thing, to the object, it moves around and it exists not as a kind of, it can't exist very easily as a uh, TikTok. <laughs> but I think what it can do is it can create a kind of reference to it. And I think um, maybe it, it can act as an opportunity to, to create interest, to kind of, um, to be able to, uh, as an invitation, as an open, open, um, like I think about the work of one of my doctoral students, Esan Akbari, who did his um, dissertation research with young people using mobile media and cartography. And um, one of the projects entailed uh, students, participants making images of places as invitations for others to go and travel and see and be a part of. And so, um, while not a perfect representation of a place or an experience, much like an installation or a sculpture, I think um, they can serve as a reference and also a kind of register to say in this time and space, there exists this pretty special thing that uh, serves as an invitation for someone to come and participate with. And so I think, um, uh, if anything, that it's that it can serve as an entanglement to be able to lead, oh, look, I want to go and see that now. Like, where is that? Let me know more about that. So um, not as a perfect representation, not as, a, as easily say as a photograph, which its intention to be made and distributed as a photograph is a little bit more um, readily disseminated. But yeah, that's a great question. Hopefully I kind of poked at it enough. <laughs> Thank you for your question. Um, we have time for maybe one more. Usually it takes a moment for people to process. Wait time. <laughs> Maybe Chris has a question. I'd be happy to ask a question. One, um, you talked a little bit about the social power of art earlier in your presentation. And then you also mentioned at one point how young people are sort of occupying spaces on their own. So they're initiating this kind of engagement with a particular space and maybe 
appropriating its use for their own kind of uh, art making or, or play-based engagement. And it had me thinking of some of the work that Brent Wilson was doing, you know, it's been years ago with, I think it was polyvore.com where young people were taking this website that was intended as a fashion website and then reappropriating its use to create digital works of art. Mm-hmm. And what came about was really massive communities like little art worlds. And so I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about maybe the importance of the social power of student initiated uh, art worlds such as that. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we are finding, I mean, we're finding them now and uh, now that there's more readily available um, social, social media like discord servers which tend to be uh, a preferred um, preferred space because they can be set up and established with um, with uh, community guidelines uh, and moderators um, that that in a sense ensure that um, that's that that people won't be trolled and that there's a certain level of decorum in these spaces. I think that's a huge concern for young young creators as the, as they as they kind of engage with that creative kind of misuse that uh, Jason Far, Farman talks about. Um, I think we're seeing less of that because the flexibility and power and openness of certain media um, that the tool is able to that the the bandwidth of the tools are are much more open now, um, but yeah, it's like I'd say early on we would see some really interesting things, um, you know, where young people uh, at school would end up on people's blogs, and use the comments as a way to interact because they were getting around firewalls uh, at their at their at their local school on their local school network as a way to interact with each other. And so I think there's um, there's a there's a really definitely a, a good tradition of that. But I do think I do think we're seeing less of that now. And like I said, for where you do have these kind of very, very flexible, very robust tools, like I said, the discourse servers tend to be um, heavily used now and less so the Reddit Reddit groups um, and how they're moderated, but definitely getting invitations into discord servers are kind of a, a, an important important practice uh, for, for young creators. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you, Juan. Sure. Uh, thanks again, um, Dr. Carlos Castro for your lecture this evening and thank you all for attending and um, asking some really uh, great questions. Um, that will be all for this evening. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.